Um, I would like to welcome you to the third session, which is about measurement of foreign direct investment and portfolio investment. And actually, we've already discussed quite a bit of this uh, so far, but we've got three exciting presentations in this session. Um, so to start off, I'd like to introduce Larkin Terry, who will be making a presentation on experimental ultimate host economy statistics for US dir uh, direct investment abroad. And this is an exciting piece of work looking at different methods for reallocating US uh, direct investment abroad and specifically equity positions to determine whether economies, uh, which economies are the ultimate hosts, but also very importantly, to un because this is important in the context of understanding where the economic benefits of the investment are felt and also where the re risks associated with the investment are. Um, so Larkin works for the International Economic Accounts Directorate of the US Bureau of Economic Analysis, where he's been based for seven years. Um, and he has an interesting academic background, having originally studied political science before doing an MSc in applied statistics. So uh, Larkin, over to you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you very much, um, and thank you for all for attending, and thanks to the organizers uh, for this opportunity to present some uh, exciting research from the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis. So for the first time ever, we have uh, experimental statistics that estimate where uh, U.S. direct investment abroad really goes, rather than just the first stop on the uh, ownership chain. Uh, I, should, I should say that the views expressed here uh, belong to me and my co-authors, and don't necessarily represent the U.S. Uh, Bureau of Economic Analysis or the U.S. Commerce Department. And I also really need to thank my co-authors, all of whom are also from the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis, uh, Jessica Hanson, Ricardo Limay, Kirsten Brew, and Ryan Smith. Uh, and we could not have done this project with, without the hard work of BEA survey analysts who are fundamentally responsible for producing the data on which all of this is based. Um, and how do I advance? Okay. Okay, uh, the U.S. direct investment position abroad is the value that U.S. multinational enterprises, or uh, MNEs, have invested in their foreign affiliates, and it is produced uh, from BEA's quarterly survey of U.S. direct investment abroad. Um, so in 2019, which is the year this research covers, the aggregate value of those investments was $5.84 trillion. Um, direct investment position is recorded as being in the country where the first or directly own entity outside of the US in the multinational ownership uh, chain is located. Uh, this is done in accordance with international guidelines from the IMF's Balance of Payments Manual and the OECD's benchmark definition of direct investment. Uh, this treatment ensures consistency in the international transactions accounts and the, and the international investment position statistics across all investment categories as it covers the cross-border flow of funds between the United States and the counterparty in the transaction. So on this basis, U.S. direct investment abroad, as you can see, is highly concentrated with the top 14 host countries uh, listed on this graphic, accounting for over 80% of the position in 2019. Uh, this concentration of investment, particularly since the investment doesn't stay in many of these countries, which we will see in a moment, is essentially the motivation for this research. Um, but first, why is this investment so concentrated? And the answer to that is the, uh, the growth in the use of holding companies by US multinationals as the first entity in their ownership chains. Uh, these holding companies tend to be established in countries with advantageous tax or regulatory regimes, and they then own uh, the rest of the foreign affiliates on down the chain. Um, I think I skipped ahead too far. Sorry, this is the slide I was talking about. So in, uh, in 1982, holding companies accounted for less than 10% of the U.S. In uh, direct investment position abroad. Uh, by 2017, however, they reached a peak of uh, 52% and still account for 47% of the position as of 2022. Okay, now this slide. Uh, from BEA's annual and benchmark surveys of U.S. direct investment abroad, which cover the financial and operating data of U.S. multinationals, uh, we know that the investment does not stay in many of the countries with the largest, pop with the largest positions. Um, the, 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 this chart features the, the top 10 countries in terms of how much of the position they account for, shown in orange, alongside those same countries in terms of 
how much of the value added they account for, shown in blue. I'm sorry, this is, I'm going in the, keep going in the wrong direction. Okay. Um, uh, so this, uh, uh, so, so, okay, so again, these are the top 10 countries in terms of how much of the position they account for, shown in orange, alongside those same countries in terms of how much of the value added they account for, shown in blue. Uh, the value added of foreign affiliates is their contribution to the host country's GDP. Uh, while we don't expect the, these bars to be uh, exactly equal, uh, the size of the difference between them does provide insight into whether uh, U.S. investment stays in the country or passes through. Okay, so countries like Luxembourg, the Netherlands, UK islands in the Caribbean, and Bermuda all have significant position but low value added, uh, indicating that investments in these countries are passing on to affiliates in other countries. Uh, one reason for this may be to take advantage of these countries' more favorable tax structures. Uh, for all of the countries shown in the chart where the orange bar is higher than the blue bar, uh, with the exception of the UK, the national corporate tax rate is below the OECD average. Um, in contrast, Canada, Ireland, Switzerland, and Australia all have higher value added percentages than position, uh, indicating that investments are being routed through affiliates in other countries before ending up in those countries. Um, and ultimately, this research is trying to find out where the position is actually invested, since we know much of it is not staying in the countries that it immediately goes to. Okay, I'm going forward. Okay, so while that's all great in theory, um, actually doing it is uh, a little complicated, and um, now let's, let's talk about that. Okay, so uh, this table lays out the six ways of reallocating the position statistics to the ultimate host economy, or, or UHE, uh, that we tested in this research. Um, so all six are, are in, the, in, the, in the working paper, which is available to you all online. Um, and, and I would encourage to, you, to, you to read it if you, want to, if you want to learn more. And we do welcome feedback and comments on all six methods. Uh, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to talk about uh, the three methods that we identified as our preferred methods and that we think merit further research. Uh, so these are what we call the two push-down methods, uh, the first operating affiliate method and the last affiliate method, and then the pass-through with ownership chains method. Um, but before we uh, d dive into a discussion of these methods, um, I should note that uh, from this point on, we're, we're going to be focusing on the equity position rather than the total position. Uh, the eventual goal is to reallocate the total position, but as a, as a practical first step, uh, we researched allocating the equity position, which, uh, which did account for 98.5% of the total position in 2019. So we'll start with the pushdown methods. As the name suggests, uh, the pushdown methods uh, push or move the position from the first entity in the ownership chain to another entity or entities. Uh, these methods do not try to reallocate the position to uh, every entity along the ownership chain, uh, but they do still provide users with uh, useful insight since they do look beyond the holding companies. Uh, the, the first operating affiliate method reallocates the position from holding companies to the first non-holding company uh, affiliate in the ownership chain. Uh, it, it doesn't matter how many other companies there are in the ownership chain. Uh, this method stops once it gets to an, an operating or, uh, or non-holding company. Uh, if the first affiliate is an operating company, the position is not reallocated. Um, okay, the first operating affiliate uh, is the method recommended uh, for producing UHE statistics in the upcoming Balance of Payments manual update. It was selected there primarily for its ease of use and the limited uh, information resources it requires. Uh, one, one reason that we, that we selected uh, first operating affiliate as one of our uh, preferred methods is that it is being recommended in the BOP manual update, and uh, we want to be able to compare statistics with uh, other countries that pursue this method. Okay. Um, okay. OK, sorry, uh, last affiliate method also on this slide. So you might be thinking, though, that the uh, first operating affiliate is not quite what you had in mind when you heard the term ultimate host economy. Uh, the last affiliate method addresses that concern by reallocating the equity position to the last entity in the ownership chain uh, rather than the first. Uh, this method ignores all intermediate affiliates and reallocates directly to the bottom of the ownership chain. Uh, so uh, uh, to make these methods a little clearer, uh, let's uh, walk through an ownership chain and to see how they actually work. 
And I'm, I'm afraid we've lost the animation with the PDF conversion, but I think this should still be pretty straightforward. Um, so in, in, in this overly simplified ownership chart, uh, the US parent multinational is at the top of the chain uh, in the US. Uh, affiliate A is the first entity outside of the US, and, and it's a holding company in, uh, in Luxembourg. Um, as a reminder, this is where the position statistics currently reflect uh, this multinational's uh, direct investments. Uh, that is, the value of affiliates A, B, and C are all currently reflected in Luxembourg by, by international guidelines. Uh, in the first operating affiliate method, uh, the position is reallocated from, from A to B, uh, an assembly plant in Germany. Uh, this reallocation provides data users with, uh, with a bit more information about where the productive activities of this multinational are uh, taking place. Uh, but it does ignore entity C in Poland. Um, in the last affiliate method, um, which is on, on the right there, um, uh, the, the position from A is reallocated to C, uh, a sheet metal manufacturing plant in, in Poland. So this method ignores affiliate B in Germany, uh, even if it's larger than, than the one in Poland. But again, it provides more information than recording the entire investment in Luxembourg. OK, so now we'll move on to the pass-through with ownership chains method. So the pass-through with ownership chains method uh, doesn't ignore any affiliates in the ownership chain, uh, but rather reallocates the position to each affiliate along the chain. Uh, so this method may be more conceptually pure than the, uh, the push-down methods, since it calculates the position uh, for each affiliate in the ownership structure. But as, as you can imagine, it, it is highly data-intensive, and it requires the, uh, the data compiler not only to know about the structure of the, uh, of the multinational, but to have uh, detailed financial information about, e about each entity uh, in the chain. Our BEA is very fortunate to have this type of information available from our uh, annual and benchmark surveys, but, but even so, applying this method uh, does turn out to be pretty, pretty challenging. Um, so the, uh, the pass-through with ownership chains method built upon Borga and Caliandro's 2018 NBER working paper on pass-through capital. Uh, this method reallocates the, the, the position by calculating the proportion of the position that passes through to affiliates lower down in the, uh, in the ownership chain. So for example, if an affiliate had $1 billion in owner's equity and 800 million passes through to other affiliates, um, the reallocated position in this affiliate is $200 million. Um, so again, let's do an example to illustrate the method. Um, so we have the same, the same structure as before, uh, with the entire position recorded in A. Uh, with, um, with the pass-through with ownership chains method, uh, the position in A moves to B, uh, where the amount that remains as B is calculated in terms of its pass-through equity. Uh, the program then moves on to C to determine uh, those values in the third tier. So in this simple example, with uh, C being the last entity, it gets whatever remained after B, uh, but most ownership chains are longer, and the programs uh, work through iteratively until they reach the bottom of the chain. Um, so with the pass-through with ownership chains method, we end up with some, some position recorded in both Germany and Poland, uh, depending on their financial data, and we could also see some position remaining in, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in Luxembourg, depending on the financial data of, of that entity. Uh, so now let's move on to look at some of the actual uh, results. So this chart features the largest reallocations in the equity position by country for the pass-through with ownership chains method. Uh, so keep in mind that the pass-through with ownership chains method uh, reflects the equity position that stays in, uh, in each foreign affiliate and does not go on to another affiliate further down the ownership chain. Uh, so this chart features the top 10 largest positive reallocations in position at the country level, and the five largest negative reallocations, which are at, at the bottom of the chart. Uh, you'll notice that some of the countries are missing bars, and those will be filled in shortly. Uh, they were the largest reallocations for one of the other methods. So this slide uh, adds the results of the first operating affiliate and, uh, method in gray. Um, as a reminder, these are the first non-holding companies uh, in the ownership chains. Many of the largest uh, reallocations by country are the same as we saw from the pass-through method, but several appear for the first time. Uh, that is not to say that these countries did not receive any reallocated position from the, from the other methods, 
but they were just not in the top 10 uh, for those methods. So finally, this slide adds the results of the last affiliate method in orange. Uh, these are the entities at the bottom of US multinationals ownership chains. Again, many of the countries are the same as in the past through and first operating affiliate methods, uh, but several do appear for the first time. So in all three methods, the five largest negative reallocations where the position that's being reallocated away from are, are, are all the same, and they're what we would expect from the value added data we saw previously. They're uh, Luxembourg, Netherlands, Bermuda, UK islands in the Caribbean, and Singapore. Uh, it's important to note that while countries with advantageous tax and regulatory regimes have, do, ha do have position being reallocated away from them, they do not go to zero in, in any of the methods we explored. So quickly, uh, let's do the, these are the sector level results. Um, so uh, as expected in all three methods, holding companies saw the negative, the largest negative reallocation across all three methods. Um, in fact, they were the only sector that saw a, a net decrease in position after reallocation. And affiliates in manufacturing tended to see the largest gains uh, across all of the methods. Um, to summarize, um, so I've discussed three ways out of the six in the paper uh, to reallocate the US direct investment abroad equity position from the highly concentrated holding companies in countries with advantageous tax and regulatory regimes, which are these uh, large orange circles and that dominate published position statistics, to the ultimate host economies, where US multinationals are really invested and producing goods and services. Um, OK, so where do we go from here? Uh, the first step is soliciting feedback from data users uh, at international working groups that BEA participates in at the IMF and OECD and at conferences like this one. Uh, so based on that feedback, BEA will select a method or methods uh, to produce and resolve outstanding questions like the reallocation of debt positions. And finally, uh, we, we do plan to incorporate the selected methodology into our production systems. So, and the end goal of this project is the inclusion of UHE statistics in BEA's annual direct investment by country and industry release, which occurs each July. And uh, these are some discussion questions we're interested in getting your feedback on, but uh, we welcome any and all feedback, and thank you very much. Thank you, Larkin. Um, we're going to take the questions at the end, so I'm going to move on to our next speaker, who is Carlos Figueira, whose presentation is entitled, Where the Real Impact of where is the real impact of foreign direct investment, the case of Portuguese outward FDI? Um, like the US, Portugal is at the forefront of efforts to understand which countries are the ultimate hosts of FDI. And Carlos is going to present a fascinating study using data from sources that include the Eurogroup's register, which uh, contains crucial information for this kind of analysis. Carlos has more than six years of experience at the Banco de Portugal and is currently an economist statistician with the External Statistics Division. He has a master's degree in economics and a postgrad degree in statistical systems. Carlos. Thank you. Is it working? Yes? It, I think it is. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, let me thank you. I uh, thank the organizers for um, this amazing conference and for the opportunity to be here presenting the work of Banco de Portugal on this uh, compilation of UHE statistics. So uh, here you have the plan for, for my presentation. So I will very briefly introduce you why we need this UHE statistics. Uh, after this presentation, I think I don't, I don't have a, a hard work on that there, but uh, just a few words. Uh, on that, then I will present you the methods we use to produce our estimates, and after that I will tell you about the data sources we use. So we use two data sources, and I will explain how we use them to, to produce our estimates. After that we will have a look on the results, and I'll have a comparison of the results across the methods, and finally I will leave you with some uh, final remarks on the data sources and a possible way forward. So why we need this um, UHE statistics. So as we have been discussing, we know that complex ownership structures are distorting our um, FDI statistics, both geographically and in terms of uh, economic uh, activity uh, allocation. Uh, so this is the main reason why we need this FDI statistics by UHE, so to enhance basically the interpretability and the usefulness of uh, our uh, FDI statistics. 
And as we already heard previously, theoretically, we know what we, what we want, right? So we know that the ideal objective would be to uh, produce UHG statistics, allocating the investment to uh, the economy or the economies where productive activities are taking place. So we want to, to have or to find the economies where FDI is producing its real economic effects. However, we know that in practice, this is a very difficult task because and that's not always possible since ownership structures are increasingly complex due to, we know, several factors. Um, m and are channeling their uh, investments through not a single company or a single SPE, but through a large chain of SPEs or even uh, operating units. And that basically uh, means that we will need um, uh, a significant amount of data and uh, the, there is here a high degree of complexity. And as a result, we need practical guidance. We need to find pragmatic uh, and a feasible approach, always bearing in mind, as we already pointed out today, that increasing reporting burden should be av avoided and that we should ensure cross-country comparability. And I mean, that's precisely why we need this um, exercise, this experimental statistics is that is basically to provide insights on the development of methodological guidance. OK, now about the methods. Um, so basically, we built upon the classification of our American colleagues, and we basically tested three methods. One apportionment method, as explained, basically here we are allocating the immediate outward FDI positions using economic variables from, from a third data set, in our case uh, using the OFATS data, so the outward uh, foreign affiliate statistics. And then we also used two hybrid methods that were possible thank you, thanks to the EGR, so the Eurogroups register. Uh, and here we are combining uh, aspects from both apportionment and pushdown methods. So this means that we will be pushing the, the, the immediate position down the honor, ownership chain to either the first operating unit or the last unit in investment chain. And then based on uh, a third data set, we'll again do the apportionment, uh, for example, using a variable such as employment. OK, now about uh, the, the data sources, I already mentioned the two of them that we used. Just a very brief um, explanation of uh, each of them. So in the OFATS, as I said, this means outward foreign affiliate statistics. So basically there we have data on each foreign affiliate that in our case is controlled by Portuguese uh, entities. And we have information also on um, economic variables that describe the activity of those enterprises like turnover or employment data. In terms of the EGR, so here we are talking about an European statistical register uh, on multinational enterprise groups that have presence in the EU or EFTA areas, area. Um, and as there as well, we have information about some economic uh, activity. In particular, we have employment data by uh, legal unit. OK, just to make this more concrete, how we use those, um, those two data sources. So when using the OFATS approach, uh, where the group structure is not available. That's one important point and one important difference to the EGR. Uh, so just considering this example here, very simple. Let's imagine we have a company A that has 1,000 million euros in, in terms of outer FDI position. And let's assume that in OFATS we have information that this company through its affiliates is generating 20% of its turnover in Spain, 10% in Netherlands, 30% in Poland, and 40% in Brazil. So we would this, use this structure to allocate this outward FDI position. And again, remind, uh, let's keep in mind that we don't have here the group structure. So we will use, uh, we will allocate the, the position to all the, the, the affiliates and to uh, their countries. When we move to the EGR approach, basically, the process is a bit similar, but here we have an addi additional step because we have access to the group structure of the, the companies, uh, of the, the groups. And so we will basically have an additional step, which is going through the group structure until we find the ultimate host economy, which can be either the first operating unit or the last unit in investment chain. And as you can see in this uh, very simple example, we will have different, uh, uh, different geographic allocation. This is just a picture of our, of our database, just to illustrate what we did. So departing from the EGR, we built, the, we built this um, groups uh, database that we'll then use to cross with our internal FDI database, which is at the granular, granular uh, level. 
Just uh, very briefly, a comparison of these two data sources, let me just point out two main aspects. So uh, the first uh, main aspect is that with the EGR, we, have, we can identify non-resident SPs. And we also have, as I already said, the group structure. So this enables us to go through the group structure and to look through non-resident uh, non SPs and also holding companies until we find the ultimate host entity. And the other important difference is that when using the EGR, we can um, define the ultimate host economy um, as the compiling economy. So we can have Portugal as the ultimate host, which, which is not possible when using the LFATs because there we just have foreign controlled affiliates. Now, this, is, this picture is just to summarize the, 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 the results in a very simple example. So if we use the OFATS approach, we would be considering country A, B, and C as the ultimate uh, host economies. If we move to the first operating unit approach, we would consider country B as the ultimate host economy. And if we, if we move to the last unit investment chain approach, we would have country C. And as you can see, we will have different allocations, both geographically and in this very simple example, also in terms of economic activity allocation. Now, let's move to the results. This first slide is just to point out that our, uh, the representativeness of our exercise, which is quite high, especially when we are looking at the EGR approach or the two EGR approaches. Um, then I have here these uh, two graphs that basically aim to answer the question of how many links we have to look through until we get to the ultimate host unit. And if we start with the first operating unit, you can see that in most of the cases we stop at the first unit. So the immediate subsidiary is the ultimate host entity in 90% of the cases, which account for 68% of the outward FDI positions. Um, and then if we compare this with the last unit investment chain, Still, most of the cases we stop at the first operating unit, at the first unit in the, in the chain, but this only accounts for 31% of the outward FDI position. So there is here the, a reduction to, um, to less than half. And still, here in this approach, we can see that we have significant amounts of outward FDI positions allocated to the third and the fourth link, 12 and 33% respectively. Okay, now I have here a couple examples. I will not cover all of them because uh, of uh, time constraints, but if you are interested, you can see here very concrete cases where um, you can see how the different approaches lead to different results, both geographically and in terms of economic activity allocation. Okay, moving to the uh, outward FDI positions in an immediate basis, you can see that we have the main partners for Portugal are the Netherlands, with 52%, Spain with 10%, and Luxembourg with 6%. So there is a great part of the outward FDI positions that are directed to um, financial centers, as you can see. Now let's see how uh, this picture will look like. Okay, here we have a, um, a small issue with the slide, so the PDF conversion was not uh, okay. So, But let me try to summarize the, the message here. So it was supposed to have here the OFATS uh, table, EGR with the first unit and the EGR with the uh, last unit in investment chain, but I will just point out the main uh, aspects. So first of all, um, the, the investment, the Portuguese investment that is directed to the financial centers, meaning here Netherlands and Luxembourg is reduced a lot. You can see, for example, here in the OFATS that Luxembourg doesn't, does not appear in the top 13 and uh, Netherlands only accounts for 1% and not 52%. Okay. If you look at the results for the other um, two approaches, which you can find on the paper, for example, uh, you will see that for the first operating unit, Portugal will be the main destination of um, outward, the Portuguese outward FDI. So we would have a very significant degree of round tripping, 17% of the positions. And then countries like Poland and Spain have um, a much imp uh, significant increase in this, um, in this regard. But then when we move to the last unit in investment chain approach, you will see that first Portugal decreases a lot its um, uh, weight. So it goes from 17% to 6%. And the countries that account for the, the, the majority of the outward FDI position are in first place Brazil and in second place Colombia. And then we come again Spain and, and Poland. So the first important me message here is that the weight of the financial centers is reduced a lot when looking to UHE statistics. 
Now, in terms of economic activity, um, I mean, the first important, important aspect that will uh, stand out here is that we have um, significant uh, po uh, amount of positions that are not allocated in terms of economic activity, but this is due to um, a limitation of the EGR database because we, when we go through the group structure, we have lots of cases where we end up in, con in uh, entities that are located outside the EU. And, uh, non, and, and that are non-EFTA countries. So for those cases, we, not, uh, we don't always have the, the economic, um, in this case, the nice classification. So we cannot classify the economic activity. Still, there is here an important result. And here we are just comparing the first, un the first operating unit approach with the last unit in, investment, uh, in the investment chain approach. And you, the, the, the important message is that when we move from one to the other, you can see that the financial sector which here is section K from the NACE, reduces a lot, a lot its importance. And then this is compensated with an increase in, let's say, more productive sectors, so non-financial sectors, as manufacturing sector, which here is section uh, C, the electricity sector, section D, or even the construction sector, section F on, the, on this graph. I will also skip this slide, but this is just to illustrate that uh, there is some concentration in terms of economic activity. And then let me just move to the final part of my presentation. So concentrating in the, on the EGR uh, database, which is um, an important uh, and a useful resource or a useful tool to produce these statistics, uh, let me point out the advantages. Um, as I said before, it enables us to go through non-resident SPEs and holding companies because we have access to the group structure. And so we can either stop at the first operating unit or go uh, up to the bottom of the investment chain. And then we can also allocate outward investments to the compiling economy whenever it makes sense, so round tripping cases. Still, there are some challenges. Um, so we have some missing values for the non-resident SPE uh, variable, um, and also some missing values, as I already pointed out, for non-EU, non-EFTA entities. And finally, I have here another point, which I don't have the time to enter into detail, but the EGR uh, has employment data by legal unit, but when we, it comes to the turnover data, it's only available by enterprise and not by legal unit, which is the perspective we follow in uh, FDI statistics. Okay, so in terms of uh, conclusions, just to summarize, um, summarize them, so our UHE estimates basically depend on the method we, we follow, uh, as we uh, showed. Um, in terms of important results, we showed that when we look or when we move from immediate counterpart basis to uh, ultimate host um, analysis, we will see that pass-through countries like the Netherlands and Luxembourg reduce a lot their importance in terms of the Portuguese outward FDI. Um, when using the EGR, we saw that um, this uh, data source allows us to identify Portugal as the ultimate host economy. And in our case, it's important because we have some cases of uh, round tripping. Um, and when we look at the um, last uh, unit in investment chain approach, we see that first Portugal reduces its importance. So the round tripping is not as large as it shows in the first uh, operating unit approach. And um, we also saw that countries where productive, productive activities likely take, take place, like Brazil and Colombia, those countries increase their share on the outward FDI, Portuguese outward FDI. And finally, we also saw that when we go until the last unit in investment chain, the financial sector reduces a lot its importance and uh, non-financial sectors like the manufacturing sector increases its relevance. And in terms, uh, just briefly, in terms of possible next steps, um, we have to, we can enhance a bit the exercise on some specific cases, but more importantly, we want to produce these UHG statistics for a larger time span to have a possibility of making a, a consistency analysis across time. Then, obviously, as I already said, we want to use our insights to contribute to the development of methodological guidance, including uh, the development of a formal definition of a first operating unit, be because it is, as I already pointed out, the recommended approach uh, within the, the new manuals. And finally, we want to explore, explore some other uh, methods to produce these um, estimates. I also have here some questions for discussion. So, um, but again, I'm happy to, um, to hear your thoughts on, on this topic about these questions or, or other comments. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Okay, so the final uh, presentation, we're going to move um, away from FDI and back to something that we were discussing uh, earlier. Um, our final presenters in this session are Mikola Ryzhenkov and Fausto Pastores. Um, Mikola is a senior lecturer at, uh, in economics at Osnabrück University in Germany, and uh, Fausto is a senior economist statistician at the ECB where he has worked for 10 years. Um, the title of this presentation has changed slightly. Uh, it's uh, Where are the missing securities in external statistics? And it focuses on financial assets that are missing from official external statistics because they're held with foreign custodians. I'm looking forward to your detective work in this area. Thank you. <laughs> I will try to do my best. Uh, yeah, so uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for including our paper to the agenda. So today, Fausto and I will present our joint work with George Diaz Diaz and Martin Schmitz from the ECB and Joao Silva from the World Bank. And of course, so uh, our results, so it's our, our own views and not the views of ECB, Euro, uh, uh, Euro system or the World Bank. Yeah, uh, so in portfolio investment, uh, there is a uh, uh, known uh, statistical puzzle that globally ex external assets in portfolio investments are smaller than external liabilities. So we have already talked about this today. And for example, so when if we use external wealth of nations data set, and then uh, yeah, adds like additional data like from uh, Sefer or SSIO, uh, for example, for 2022, uh, this gap is equal to 4.2 trillion uh, uh, US dollars. But for example, for our baseline year, so for which we will use later, so let's keep in mind, so this gap is 6.1 trillion dollars. So why does it happen? Yes, of course, on the one hand, it is, oops, it is easier to track liabilities, but why it is harder to track assets? Yes, so on the one hand, it happens because uh, some investors use custodians in third countries, so it is hard to track them, uh, their, these investments. But of course, some investors, so they try to evade taxes or hide savings offshore and so on. What do we know from the literature? Yeah, so it's gonna, it was, um, there is a flow of literature that try to solve um, uh, this puzzle and it was uh, found that for example households are one of the important sectors that holds uh, offshore wells but uh, there is also some evidence that uh, uh, NFCs also could be responsible for a part of that and also if you talk about portfolio uh, discrepancies uh, so it also was fine that uh, investment fund shares are as very important driver for uh, this global discrepancy. So keeping this in mind that uh, households and NFCs could hold these offshore wells and it's mainly through uh, investment fund shares. So we ask ourselves research question. Yeah. So can securities held in custody uh, abroad be considered the missing, uh, the missing link that can help us to close this asset liability gap in portfolio investment? And uh, our contribution what, what we are doing in this study and our contribution is that, uh, so we estimate a dynamic link between third party holdings of investment fu uh, fund shares and foreign held uh, cross-border uh, deposits of households and NFCs. And using this um, investigation, yes, yeah, so we uh, recover uh, missing securities, missing assets using flow focused approach. So we do not look at uh, the positions, so we look at the transactions. Uh, yeah, so before I, I move to election analysis, so the simple idea that we keep in mind, so for example, assume you want to invest um, in some shares through custodian in third country, so what you should do as an investor? So you should open your deposit, yes, and then use, like, in, in the country of custody, and then use this deposit uh, to invest. Yes, so what should we expect? That before you invest, this money should be withdrawn, right? So our assumption that before we uh, observe spikes in... Uh, Info, like spikes in third party holdings, we should see withdrawal of deposits. So it should be negative link between uh, the two. Keeping this in mind, so we started with uh, some simple, uh, just very general uh, hypothesis that cross border deposits inflows or outflows in country I are negatively correlated with, uh, with asset liability gap uh, versus this country. So we used uh, um, IP data of the euro area and then biannual data, CPAS data on the one hand to measure uh, uh, gap. 
and then LBS uh, data on deposits. Yeah, so some pr preliminary analysis so show that uh, it could be possible that uh, there is negative correlation between flows of deposits and uh, the gap, for example, using the example of Ireland and Luxembourg. But what's important is the second hypothesis. So let's uh, dig deeper. So remember that we assumed that uh, third party holdings could be this missing link uh, for the gap. So our second hypothesis states that cross-border deposits, so inflows or outflows, held in country I by uh, households and NFCs from country J are negatively correlated with third-party holdings of security, uh, securities uh, held in uh, custodian country I by um, agents from country J. To test the, this hypothesis, so we construct a data set that on the one hand has uh, LBS uh, data on deposits, uh, like bilateral cross-border deposits by households and NFCs on the one hand, and third-party holdings derived from uh, security holdings database of investment fund shares by private sector. So in, we construct the quarterly data sets for uh, between uh, fourth quarter of 2013 and fourth quarter of 2021 for uh, 158 countries. And then one observation, so we have holder country, custodian country, and then uh, total uh, ho like holdings of all investment fund shares and also as robustness check holdings of investment fund shares um, issued by Irish and uh, uh, Irish investment funds and investment funds from Luxembourg. And I also should mention, so we uh, like use three custodians, which, which are Belgium, Ireland and Luxembourg. So uh, constructing this database, so uh, we run the following regression again. So um, we just want to establish uh, first uh, the direction, like the timing, the direction of link and the magnitude of uh, this effect. So we run a simple regression. So where in the left hand side we have transactions. So it's not change in position, it's a transaction in third party holding uh, regressed on current change in deposits and lacked deposits. And since our baseline um, is to recover like globally uh, missing assets for all for all available countries. So uh, in our baseline, we aggregate. So we uh, regress um, for each country, available country, we regress aggregate transactions in third party holdings and aggregate cr cross border uh, deposits of households and NFCs. But also as robustness check, so we run bilateral uh, uh, regression while controlling for additionally custodian fixed effects and the elasticities are pretty close. But uh, using this aggregate, and uh, data. So we uh, obtain the following results that uh, correlation, uh, yeah, correlation between transactions in third party holdings and current uh, change in deposits. So it's not statistically significant while lacked um, uh, correlation of transactions with lacked change in deposits is as we expected has negative sign and uh, is statistically significant. Uh, so we can um, interpret it as uh, so before uh, making um, investments, so indeed it could be the case that uh, investors, so they uh, so, uh, they open dep deposits, but then before making investments, these deposits are withdrawn, and then uh, yeah, so positive uh, third-party holdings are so associated with withdrawal of deposits, and there is time lag. Uh, so while uh, doing this uh, type of operation. So we find that uh, using all issuances held by all, all countries, so we find that um, reduction, like net reduction of deposits by $1 increased third party holding by $2.5. Uh, so as a robustness check, so uh, first assumption that probably, uh, so since it's, uh, this data are, are collected mainly, for, like are collected for custodians in Euro area, so probably for Euro area countries, it's better quality data. So out of these 158 countries, we drop euro area countries. And then we also find negative correlation, so uh, lacked um, relationship. It's a bit, it's stronger. So yeah, our assumption would be that probably non-EU countries, so they use um, it more uh, actively. And then, so another robustness check. So as I mentioned, so we have both all Issu uh, like uh, issuances of all investment fund funds and also EU and Luxembourg, uh, uh, Ireland and Luxembourg investment fund shares. So when we consider only um, uh, 
issuances of uh, like by, by these two countries. So our results are not uh, significantly different from uh, the baseline estimation from all from total uh, uh, total holdings. So in the very end, uh, so while moving forward, so we uh, keep in mind, so we take that correlation between transactions in third party holdings and uh, leg deposits is minus 2.5. And we also take a um, yeah, standard error to build 68% confidence band. So it's one standard deviation that we uh, like one standard deviation that we obtain from regression results. So then, so uh, we have uh, this correlation between flows and uh, in uh, third party holdings and uh, deposits. So now we want to construct missing assets. But since we want with deltas, so we need start some starting point based on which we can then construct our missing assets. So we set uh, starting, uh, for starting value, we set period 2008, quarter four. And in order to yeah, build this initial value, so we used ratio of portfolio, of portfolio investment to other investment for IAP of Euro area as, and our assumption that we can extrapolate it to the uh, globally. So we, in this initial period, we multiply deposits by this starting value. And then for each uh, subsequent uh, um, quarter, so we use previous uh, missing assets value from previous quarter uh, and uh, lacked deposits um, pre-multiplied by the coefficient that we obtain in our regression analysis. Uh, so we stop in 2021 Q4, so we build this chain. We stop in 2021 Q4 because we don't, we don't want to include uh, 2022. Uh, with a lot of financial uh, sanctions. And uh, so then we assume, okay, let's assume that current statistic does not include this missing assets. And then we recover adjusted CPAS position by adding CPAS uh, data as we have assets and these missing assets that we calculate. And using our confidence interval, so we also have upper and lower bound for the estimate. So uh, our results show that for all CPA countries that are present in CPAS, so we obtained $4.9 trillion uh, uh, of missing assets, which is 9.7% um, of total adjusted, so CP, uh, CPAS and plus missing, so uh, uh, of recovered position, or 5.5% of uh, global GDP. Uh, then we also look at top uh, 20 reporters in CPAS. We find that for these 20 countries, missing assets are 3.8 trillion, which is 8.8% of this recovered position or 5.6% of GDP. Then when we look inside these 20 uh, countries, so we, first thing we can see that in absolute uh, values, of course, so main, uh, uh, so in absolute values, main, um, uh, like countries most responsible for these missing assets are uh, like, like G7 countries as US, UK, Germany. Then another conclusion that uh, six countries are responsible for roughly 50% of missing assets. Uh, another conclusion that we can make that despite all heterogeneity that we can see, for example, in charts to the right. So uh, missing assets are in the countries that suffer the most from it, so have uh, the highest uh, relative values. So it's around 15-20% uh, of total adjusted position. And uh, then in terms of the size of economy, so the biggest size of missing assets are for financial centers. Then how robust are our results uh, as compared to other estimates? Uh, so. Um, we found, uh, like we started, uh, our motivating uh, evidence was that global discrepancy in portfolio investment in 2021 was $6.1 trillion. So in previous table, uh, our uh, aggregate results was since we use CPAS data, so it was for countries in CPAS, but uh, weak, you too, great. So, but we can, uh, of course, but um, with our data, we can also produce estimates for some countries that are missing in CPAS an aggregate uh, estimate for missing assets is roughly $5.5 trillion, which is 90% of uh, the gap uh, that we, that we uh, found before in 2021. Uh, and uh, what is great for these estimates is that it is used, uh, obtained using external data as compared to the data that we uh, uh, used for a gap. 
Also, we, we compared uh, our estimates, so we did bilateral estimates using the same step for Switzerland. Since for Switzerland, you can see this data uh, directly. And the, our estimate is uh, around 60% of um, uh, data we can see from reported by Switzerland. But yeah, maybe it could be possible because, uh, for example, starting value uh, should be different. While so here we used uh, average globally. Uh, yeah, so we, uh, in our paper, we try to estimate this, uh, whether we can use third party holdings and deposits to fill this missing uh, gap. And uh, so it's more on analytical side. And now let me give last minute to Fausto to give more conclusions. Yes, I see I have 43 seconds, so uh, I will not go there. <laughs> Just to say I'm very happy that uh, Mikola did all the heavy lifting, all the presentation. I will not give any number, any model or any estimates, but just um, a couple of words on um, what is the, in addition to the conclusion of the paper on the missing assets, wh what are the recommendations to the statistical community? And this I'm also very, very happy that basically it's the same conclusion that Gian Maria presented this morning. So we started from this statistical issue that is the same, meaning that global liabilities are larger than global assets. Uh, Gian Maria did a lot of work on trying to find ways to, to reduce this, this estimate via investigating data sources and the reporters. We took a different angle. We did an econometric model. We did uh, some estimates with some assumptions. Um, but the conclusion for the statistical community is the same. It is very important that we find a way as a global statistical community to reflect these third party holdings somehow. And the way forward being CPIS, the data set where these global holdings are there, could be that um, there should be a possibility to enhance CPIS with information on third party holdings. So that holding, so countries report not all, only the holding of uh, their own residents, but also holding of foreign residents that are kept in custody in their own countries. So this is my very brief contribution. Thank you very much. Um, I know we're running a bit late, but I do want to um, have a little bit of time for questions. I'm going to see if people put up their hands and, well, uh, in the meantime, while the mic is going around, I'm just going to ask one quick question of my own um, to both of the people who are working on foreign direct investment, both seem to be developing methods that are better at identifying the ultimate host economy. But what I was interested in was that we come up with two very different methods, one from the US, I think, favoring pass through with ownership chains, and the other from Portugal, looking at the last unit method using EGR data. And of course, we also have the recommendation from the BPM update for the first operating unit method. So I'm just wondering maybe if you can say something about whether we should be flexible about the use of methods depending on the country and the data source or, or whether there is one single method. Right, uh, who are we going to go to first? Thank you. Hello? Yes, now it's working. No, nothing. Yeah, yeah. yeah right. So I have a question for Carlos, but because he's a central banker, but I guess for everyone else. Uh, what about central bank digital currencies to solve all these issues, given that you, know, you could record every transaction in a ledger, this is immutable, you think uh, it's a thing, and once you know, uh, convinced there are six, seven currencies in the world in which everything is invoiced, you should kind of solve the issue. I don't know if I'm missing something, but yeah. thanks. <coughs> At the back there. So, uh, very, interest <laughs> very interesting presentations. Um, just a question on the FDI, um, particularly for, for Larkin. Um, the U US, the data you showed, the bilateral data, the one that the MBA publishes on a bilateral basis is only at historical cost. And that's not the measure of FDI that is used in most communicated aggregate IIP statistics. And it, you know, the, the difference in the headline number is like threefold or, or close to. Uh, is there a, 
also some thinking going into mapping uh, figures to a market value uh, at the country level, uh, just because the consistency is uh, is a bit of an issue. So, if I you know download the U.S. external position from the key tables on the BA website, I find market value of, of FDI, and again, that's about three times the, 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 the historical cost estimate, which is the only one for which we have bilateral data. So I just wonder whether any progress on that side would be possible. Thank you. Can we take the lady at the back in the middle? <laughs> Uh, Pnar Yeshin from Swiss National Bank. Um, I have a question to Larkin and Carlos about FTI. Um, these, uh, first of all, are you doing the exercise only for domestically owned multinational enterprises or are you also doing those for foreign controlled ones? And then um, these companies tend to have very complex structures and uh, your figures were just straight lines downhill but um, they go into branches and they go back up. What kind of assumptions do you need to make uh, to make uh, an estimation? Do you um, I don't know, equally distribute among some end points or, um, yeah, thank you. Okay, I'm going to take one more from over there and then I'm afraid we're going to have to ask you to talk to people in the coffee break. Um, I'm Palestino Giron from the European Central Bank. Um, thank you for the three presentations for the four speakers. I think my question is perhaps related to the last one. Is for Larkin and, and Carlos, but perhaps more, more for Carlos because the aspect that I want to refer to has been explicitly mentioned by you. Uh, I have seen that um, when you are starting your analysis, you start with UCP resident in Portugal, right? So the question is, so th that means that you're excluding a great deal of foreign direct investment from Portuguese corporations, so those that are not UCPs, these are excluding from your analysis. Related to that, when you are looking for the last unit in the chain, do you move around the ownership chain or the influence chain? So you look for the 50% or you just for the 10%? The question is, uh, perhaps you have done it over the 50%, ownership, control, control. Uh, is there any insight that you can share with that? Have you started to think about the possibility to, to have a transmission of investment via influence rather than via control and what, how, how the, dif the, the, the result would be different? Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I'm just going to ask one quick more question because we've had all the questions so far for Carlos and Larkin. I do just want to bring in uh, the, the other part of the, the picture. So um, I just wanted to check with you guys um, your recommendation, um, and I th I'm sure it's something that we would all share, is that we need to um, sort of look at the, at the CPIS and improvements to the CPIS. But um, I just wonder whether you're being perhaps a bit modest about perhaps using your modeling gap to fill modeling approach to fill gaps in the meanwhile would there be any uh, would it be possible to use such an approach uh, while we get these improvements in place or would it be better just to say for the moment we don't know until we have actual data from the CPIS okay I'm going to start with Carlos Okay, uh, thank you very much for, for the questions. I will try to very brief, very quickly go through them. So um, in terms of your first question on whether we, sh we should be flexible on the method to follow, I would say um, that at this, at this um, stage where we are also trying, where we basically are trying to um, produce the first estimate and that there are, we know that uh, it was mentioned here that the asset side is always more complicated than the liability side. 
um, at this stage, and we work together in a, with the United States in a work for the revision of BD5. And basically, that was our, our proposal. It was at this stage to be flexible and to allow countries to, depending on the data they have and uh, uh, the information, basically, they have the, uh, the data sources to, to f be flexible and try. And um, because, I mean, at this stage, I think we need to try to see which uh, would be the best um, approach. And the first operating unit was the recommended approach, basically because, because of practical reasons. So that's the main issue at this stage. Um, then, uh, in terms of the, your question, the digital currencies, uh, I'm not an expert on that, but uh, I would say in a very uh, brief comment that in the end, it, uh, it always, it's always a matter of access to data and that is data sharing. Um, obviously, if we have more data, we will be um, able to um, perform different methods or to uh, be more accurate in our uh, estimates. That's my quick reaction to it. Um, then, in terms of only uh, if it's only domestically controlled entities, yes, at this stage uh, it is, um, basically because um, our data sources enables only that. That so we have the OFATs, which is basically controlled uh, affiliates by resident entities, and in terms of the EGR, basically we just have uh, or mainly have uh, controlling relationships. So which which also address your point. So it's mainly above fifty percent. Um, because it's the the what we have on the database mainly, um, and what kind of assumptions do you need? I mean, um, our assumptions basically, um, in terms of the, the branches, basically if they are present on the the database, we basically uh, treat them as any other entity. Uh, we had to uh, make some assumptions, for example, with real estate. There, what we did was basically considering that the immediate country corresponds to the ultimate host. I think it's very <laughs> it's easy in that case. Um, but then there is, I, w I would like to mention here that there is another maybe a robust, a robustness check that we can try to, to, um, to make at this stage, which is trying to uh, see, I mean, the, the, I presented the representativeness figures are quite high. You you saw that, so it's. Uh, I think the exercise is quite robust on that side. But still, we want to check the group structure to see if there is some some missing. Um, I mean, maybe there is room because the, the database is not perfect. We know it, so there maybe there is some room for um, in, in enhancing the the database because we can also uh, uh, point out if there is some missing data. So, and my advice would be especially for the Europeans that are here, that try to use the EGR and try to contribute to the EGR because then we can all benefit from that. Uh, yeah, th thank you very much for the, the questions. Um, in terms of whether the, uh, we can be flexible with one preferred method, uh, BEA is officially ag agnostic about whether one method is better than any of the others at this point. Um, that's that's why we're we're presenting uh, th three different three different methods, and there are you know, six in the paper. Um, I, I think um, we're we're open to the possibility of uh, of, of uh, sticking with with multiple methods or or selecting one based on the on the kind of feedback we get essentially. Um, in terms of the question about historical cost and market and, and market value, I'm going to have to uh, talk to my my, my co-authors about that one. Um, I'm afraid that's that's outside of my expertise, but I will I will I will do that and try to get back to you about that one. Um, and yet, and we are focusing on on domestically owned on on on, on US MNEs. Um, what kind of assumptions? Um, the uh, in terms of the, of the assumptions, um, let me maybe dodge that a little by saying it's it's in it's in the paper. Um, it, it does get very complicated, especially for the uh, the pass through with ownership chains. But we do try to spell it out in in, in the perhaps excruciating detail. But um, so, uh, in the interest of time, I'll stop there. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Thanks for the question. Just quickly on the yeah, I think indeed the the modeling approach was indeed the only thing was what is available, and that is what we we think could be a good uh, alternative as long as. Uh, the data is not there. But uh, being myself a statistical compiler, of course, I favor official statistics uh, to be as comprehensive as possible. J just to mention that, you know, I think it's very useful to have these estimates and these research projects um, to provide uh, uh, into the world also results 
results could be different from one model to another, but it's good to, you know, have discussion and show what is also uh, missing in the data. Just to mention that this transition to having this data out could be quite long because I found a very nice paper back in the IFC bulletin number 25 in 2007 that was kind of advocating the solution already long time ago. So, you know. Okay, thank you very much. And in the interest of not keeping us further from our tea and coffee, may I suggest that you um, just get hold of the presenters in the break if you've got any further questions. It just remains for me to thank all of the presenters for very interesting and provocative uh, papers and presentations. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>